start uh, this. I think we're ready to start. So uh, welcome everybody to the webinar of today. So the talk of today will be given by Melanie Fox and uh, the topic will be application of uh, laser optical diagnostic in a real size compressor component test facilities. So as usual, I introduce the speaker and uh, uh, I will leave her the stage uh, right after. So Melanie Fox is a group leader of the research team flow field measurement techniques at the LR uh, Institute of Propulsion Technology. Uh, the Department of Energy Measurement in Köln, uh, Germany. From uh, 2002 to 2004, uh, she had worked as a test engineer uh, at uh, EADS, Austrian Space Transportation, Germany, and uh, uh, been responsible uh, for ATV, uh, Jeune Verne uh, propulsion uh, uh, system. Uh, thereafter, she developed significant experience in project management, management for nationally and internationally funded uh, research projects. Since 2000. Five Dr. Fox uh, uh, joined the DLA uh, as a research fellow with a research focus on uh, laser based uh, flow field diagnostic for turbo machinery applications. She obtained a PhD, a doctor engineer, in uh, uh, 2011 uh, in the research field of uh, PIV um, adaptation and application uh, uh, in uh, turbo machinery components. In 2013, she won the DLR Science Award and and uh, since uh, 2018, she is group leader at DLR. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Melanie Fox for uh, the uh, seminar of today. So Melanie, I stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing yours. Okay. Yeah, just a few seconds, your screen share is coming. There we go, we see your screen. Um, maybe you can move it in uh, full screen mode. Isn't, is it not in full screen? Uh, no, you may need to go for presentation mode or uh, share directly the screen rather than the application now. Uh, because I see my... Uh, then just stop sharing screen and uh, do the screen share of the whole screen rather than of the application. That's that's gonna work. Sure. Yeah. The screen share is coming. Is it working right now? Uh, that's uh, yeah, just uh, a few seconds such that it uh, it can be visualized by by the internet connection. Maybe my internet connection is a little bit slow today, but I, it's coming. Yeah, perfect. It's full screen. Full screen and um, the presenting mode and not the notes. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Great. Bonjour à tous. Merci pour m'avoir ici aujourd'hui. Um, as my French is not so good as my English, <laughs> I will give this uh, presentation in English today. And I hope, um, yeah, that we uh, come to some discussion at the end. Um, yes, I'm from the in Cologne. I've um, been working there for about 17 years right now, quite a long time. And uh, today I would um, like to give you some insight into our latest research projects in um, our um, laser measurement department. And i uh, give you a short overview outline of my talk today. Um, of course, I would like to introduce the DLR and our institute at first um, and give some motivating comments um, what are the industrial demands for our measurement techniques and what is of relevance and what questions need to be answered in our context. And then I would like to show some recent applications um, in our DLR compressor facilities. I would like to start with a centrifugal compressor, um, aerodynamics um, focusing on time-resolved PIV data analysis, 
And then I would like to show some very recent um, investigation on an axle um, compressor fan stage where we try to measure blade, um, surface plate deformation. And I will end with some comments. The DLR is a federal German um, research center for aeronautics and space. And uh, we conduct research and development activities in the fields of aeronautics, space, energy, um, transport, security, and digitalization. And um, we have a part that deals with the German Space Agency and the Project Management Agency as well um, on behalf of the federal government. The DLR project management agencies oversee funding programs and support knowledge transfer. Since the last talk of uh, Chris Willard, I think three years ago, um, the DLR has grown quite a bit. Um, now we are very close to 10,000 employees in more than 55 institutes, institutes and facilities at about 30 sites at the moment. And we have um, offices in Brussels, Düsseldorf, Paris, Tokyo, and Washington DC for local dependence. Our institute is organized um, in, in two parts. We have the components departments and we have the technology departments. And there we have um, departments for engine concerns. We have departments for fan and compressor, a compartment for um, combustor activities on the research side, then the turbine department and the combustor testing um, department, which is a um, service um, department for industrial applications and large testing. And on the technology side, let's try to activate this. Here we go. Um, on the technology side, we have the numerical methods and we have um, engine acoustics and our department of um, measurement technology, where I lead the group of flow field measurement techniques. This is a um, top view of our site um, of all the facilities that we have at the Institute of Propulsion Technology in Cologne. And um, when we look at this building on the right, we have a large compression station that is providing um, up to 70 kilogram per second of compressed air up to 40 bars to provide all the facilities that we have with the necessary mass flows at high pressures. This is needed for our compressor test beds where we have a large um, axial compressor and a centrifugal compressor test bed and uh, two wind tunnel uh, cascades um, for, for, for um, compressor components. Um, they are located here in the center. Then we have combustion facilities. These are at least um, three smaller um, scientific test beds and the large um, full annular test bed for uh, combustor testing and industrial sized applications. Um, to support all that, we have uh, a gas and fuel storage area. We have our own syngas facility where we can mix own natural gases um, to make it possible to investigate power plant um, combustion applications with the local gas synthesis that is present in that area of the world. <clears throat> and of course, um, up today, we have hydrogen storage area established because hydrogen is a raising field of research in turbo machinery, as um, in the future, we are um, also looking for other fuels to be used. <clears throat> so we also deal with that. In our department, um, we develop and apply optical measure measurement technologies with respect to improvement of error engine and power plant components and for code validation. Um, we support the components and 
uh, component test beds of our institute, which are fans, compressor test beds, combustors, and uh, turbines in, located in Göttingen. And uh, we also are involved in industrial research applications for clients in aero engine and power generation industry. Today, um, our department consists of about uh, 13 people, depending on the number of students that we have around. At the moment, we are nine scientists and two engineers and one mechanic, um, supporting all the work that is done day by day. Um, we developed and apply optical methods in the following fields. Um, we have, of course, velocity measurements at hand, focusing on PIV in a very large field. Um, another velocity technique is the laser to focus technique that has been developed around 40 years ago at the Institute and is still quite um, heavily requested in industry because it's a very precise point-wise measurements um, with um, very good um, uh, easy optical access is um, possible for um, application in, in, in heavy turbo machinery. And we have um, temperature measurement tools at hand um, to mention a few, the OH planar laser induced flow fluorescence and uh, OH uh, temperature fluorescence and the filtered rally scattering technique given here. We can measure um, kerosene me, kerosene planar LIF and tomoshedography to um, get insight to fuel distribution um, of kerosene sprays in combustion chambers. And we can do species characterization with NO radicals, the OH and CO in the combustion reaction zone. We have uh, chemiluminescence measurement devices with cameras um, for the HO radical CH and CO2. And we can do suit density measurements um, with the laser induced incandescence technique. Besides that, we apply high speed shadowgraphy and other visualization techniques, the standard knee scattering, flame luminosity, and um, lately also surface deformation using the um, image pattern correlation technique. Um, and one of our major strengths is that we have um, combinations of multiple measurement techniques available, especially for the um, spectroscopy department where we uh, group, where we um, have only um, less time for measurements. So we need to synchronize measurements a lot and put um, many different um, quantities in, in one measurement slot. We also um, construct and design optical probes for high pressure test facilities in our department. We have um, very good CAD capabilities in the department um, and we um, do prototype designing. We have uh, patents running for, for such applications to make it possible even in those industrial combustion facilities to get optical insight to the reaction zone and to make it possible to um, work on, on real flight engines with our laser um, equipment. And we are also active in the technology transfer. So we have um, off, um, off um, aerospace applications as well, where we are in contact with instrumentation suppliers, with automotive applications and some uh, wind tunnel applications as well and um, some research focus in the past years has been on the development on driving units and um, synchronization units for high power LEDs for illumination of our, um, instead of lasers, instead of the unit of the use of lasers. Okay, the field of application, the topics covered, um, and this context is um, on the one hand, the fan stage of standard um, airplane turbo machinery, as well as um, compressor. This might be cascade testing as well as multi-stage machines that we have in a test bed in Cologne. Then um, we have the combustion activities and um, turbine activities, which are um, raising and, and more and more requested. Um, and we have some very, very uh, impressive 
um, project calls that we um, have applied on, and let's see if we can win the talk, win the call. Some um, motivation for what we do is that um, for the standard RIC testing that um, facilities in, in other institutions and at DLR as well do is that uh, instrumentation usually when you think of pressure probes and stuff like that is, is always structure bound. We have it wall flush integrated like static pressure taps, um, DMS facilities and stuff like that. So um, we have probes at hand like aerodynamic probes for, for temperature and pressure and um, other measurements like um, hot wire anemometry. So the impact of those probes to the flow that you would like to measure is not negligible. So um, um, on the other hand, you have CFD at hand for turbo machinery application. This is well established and gives good prediction and estimates of the primary flows, which also are easy to measure in the facilities. But the modeling problems exist near the walls, around corners, and the prediction of the secondary flows and the transition areas is um, difficult. And here, the failure of turbulent models uh, due to anisotropy or other aspects is um, not yet overcome. So those secondary flows are also difficult to measure in the turbo machinery. And what we need here is um, better validation. So the limitations are we do not have undisturbed free flow information, and we usually have only a limited spatial resolution when you think of probes to be traversed through the flow, then you do this not continuously, but on a certain grid and measure point wise. Um, looking at the laser optical diagnostic applied in facilities, it is possible to acquire free, free flow velocity information. And it also enables measurements in the rotating, in rotating parts of a compressor or a turbine where you are not able to place an aerodynamic probe. And we can um, achieve quite high spatial resolutions of, for the planar techniques. And um, today we also can derive spectral information and converge statistical quantities. Of course, there are limitations to optical diagnostics. Um, we need this optical access, which is not always trivial. Um, we need seeding particles in many cases because we do not really measure the flow, but the scattered light of distributed particles in the flow field. And at this point, the laser optical diagnostics are not certifiable. The industry demands more and more a certificate for everything, especially in aeronautics, um, but laser um, diagnostic is not certifiable at this point. And um, the optical tools um, and equipment does not work off the bat. So you always need set up human interface for the measurements and for the data processing as well. But what would we like to do then? What would we like to achieve? Um, on the one side, you have the real component testing which are expensive, time costing. Um, and on the other hand, you have the optimization and um, aerodynamic design on the simulation tools. And from both sides, you need validation data. And what we would like to achieve with our laser measurements is um, to close the gap between the conventional component testing with standard instrumentation and the prediction capabilities of the modern simulation environments. Today, due to some time and um, other limitations, I would like to um, concentrate on the compressor test facilities that we have. Um, and I would like to start with our centrifugal compressor facility where we lately had run a um, Horizon 2020 project um, funded by the Clean Sky 2 JU um, program. This um, test bed is driven by two DC motors um, in total 1.5 uh, 
megawatt are available. The maximum charge speed is 60,000 uh, rotations per minute. And in normal operation, we achieve a total pressure ratio of six to one. There is margin above, but usually we are not exceeded. The maximum mass flow um, used is 3.5 kilograms per second, and the max tip speed of the impeller is around um, 700 meter per second. The impeller exit diameter is um, 225. <laughs> And what we usually investigate here is um, advanced impeller geometries, splitter baits, and um, sweep and bend for um, blade tips, and um, advanced geometries for um, the diffuser area, like compact diffusers with uh, short axle lengths and splitter baits as well. Um, and this, this is the sketch of the whole um, facility with the incoming um, piping, a venturi nozzle for mass flow measurements, flow straighteners. Um, we have turnable sections for, for probe um, or acoustic measurements. And down here, we have the compressor. And in this case of the Rossini project that um, was um, on the Horizon 2020 Clean Sky project um, program, we um, changed the setup to um, adapt a quite standard impeller wheel, a um, blade veinless um, diffuser section, but in this case, and for industrial application, a volume was requested. And here the aims of the project were to characterize the free flow phenomena in the compressor stage using time resolved PIV. We wanted to identify um, flow instability signatures in the PIV data. Um, as they are known from unsteady pressure instrumentation. There's a special characteristic, I'll come to that in a moment. And we were looking for that in this um, centrifugal compressor as well. And we had a special focus on the onset of those instabilities and uh, the development to surge. The volume looked uh, like that, shown on the left, um, the whole, design was made in-house and the manufacturing as well at DLR Cologne. Um, the workshop did a great work. It was um, a piece of work it was made from alumina alloy. And we had a very strong requirement for the instrumentation. We should not um, disturb the flow path from domain inlet to domain outlet of this um, system. Domain inlet is this area where we have the open flange here and domain outlet is the flange at the end of the boil. And um, what we did is we built it such that internally on the lid, internal lid that covered the wheel, we established a cable channel that routed all the cable and the tubes for, for static pressure tubs so that we really did not touch the flow pass with instrumentation like that. Um, we have hidden eight tip clearance sensors, 19 Q lights, and 35 static pressure tabs in this cable channel. And all the cables have been routed through one um, single exit right here in this corner where the two channels are separated. For the timers of PIV setup, we have used two locations for the measurements. Um, the one was upstream of the wheel, about three times the wheel radius in front of the wheel entrance area, where we had optical um, access to the pipe. And we wanted to characterize the incoming flow um, as a domain inlet characterization for the numerical um, domain that um, there were a lot of calculations performed in parallel. Um, to give you some um, data of the wheel that is used here, the blade number is 15. The diffuser passage height, which um, is interesting to know, is about 14 millimeters height. And the design speed of this wheel is uh, 23,000 rotations per minute. So we are far below the capabilities of this test facility, but the industrial partner just needed it like that. The pressure ratio on um, design speed is 1.9 and the maximum mass flow at this uh, 
design point is 2.8 kilogram per second. And for this is the first PIV location that we used. And then we have established a second one um, through the volume from the side from down here to measure with a light sheet in the diffuser passage. Um, the optical access at this position was not so easy as the volume flow pass is partly overlapping with um, the diffuser section. So we needed to um, arrange a very complex viewing um, setup with the camera using this tubing arrangement with a mirror to guide um, the beam, the optical beam um, viewing arrangement into the diffuser section right downstream of the real exit where we wanted to look inside of the flow of the diffuser passage. And the light sheet was introduced um, from a side window that um, was integrated in the body of the volute with a planar window. Um, this was the only disturbance of the geometry that was accepted because this light sheet passing window was a flat window and not curved on the, um, adapted to the inner surface of the flow pass. But we put a um, number of cue lights upstream and downstream to um, measure the signature of this cavity that then is created with the clean plug, with the full flow pass undisturbed compared to the glass placed for guidance of the laser beam inside. And there was not really a signature to be detected. And the flow structures that we wanted to measure are far upstream compared to this position. So um, we have a proof that there was no upstream um, 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 coupling of this geometry. Okay, to give you an impression on the setup um, with the oblique viewing arrangement, we have a nice photograph here. Um, with the laser beam from the outside, guided from this um, system, where's my laser pointer, it's here. Um, so you see the light coming from our um, diode pumped solid state lasers. We have a light sheet collimated to about um, 250 to 400 micrometer thin light sheet. A uh, image, PIV image pairs were acquired with this um, Photon camera at 26 kilohertz. And we acquired um, 16 short bursts of about 0.4 seconds in length, <clears throat> each containing about uh, 10,640 PLV samples. And then we repeated this for a number of test points that were requested. The magnification is set slightly above or at unity. And then this green arrow indicates the upstream measurement location in the incoming pipe. And location two is the arrangement that is shown here. And in parallel to this setup, um, a unsteady pressure instrumentation was integrated to this rig. We have um, implemented 29 Q-light sensors in total, um, three Q-light arrays with five sensors each have been distributed over the wheel area in a non-symmetric relative circumferential position. So each five array enables subsequent correlation analysis um, to the time resolved um, pressure and velocity measurement results. So those measurements were taken synchronized with the PIV data. The timestamps of the PIV image acquisition was written into the same log files as um, the unsteady pressure information on different channels. <coughs> And what we were looking for is the signatures of beginning instabilities in the flow field. We know from axial compressor op um, operation that the onset of instabilities in the Fourier transform of the pressure signals has a certain shape. And when we come from the clean undisturbed operation, which is the black curve, and you see only the blade passing frequency and harmonics in the Fourier transform. For beginning instabilities, when you throttle the compressor more and more, 
do you can see in the online FFT of the pressure signals that there's such a pump developing. And when you drive it further in an axial compressor, you have rotating instabilities or other periodical um, stall cells, then you see those ripples on such a hump. This is a characteristic um, phenomena that has been found in axial turbo machinery and has been reported in the literature. Now we wanted to see if we can validate that this structure is also present in the centrifugal compressor and that this might be a criterion for us that we can look for. <clears throat> so um, we did a very intense um, performance measurement of the compressor because it was a very new rig. We needed to have a commissioning phase um, to get to know the search behavior and stuff like that. So we very precisely measured um, the behavior of the stage from 40% speed up to 100% overspeed, get an impression of the rig behavior. <coughs> and for each point during the commissioning phase, we um, took a closer look to the Q-light signals. And what you see here really is already um, the signature measured in our centrifugal compressor. It's not an image of an axial compressor, but it is one of the array of the first array Q-light um, sensors at 5% um, actual to meridional length, percent um, length. <clears throat> so we found definitely that there is this signature in the centrifugal compressor as we know from the actual machines. So now we have a criterion that we could look for during um, the further measurements. And then um, <clears throat> we um, took a closer look at the areas where those um, behavior of the operation occurs and defined measurement points for operating conditions for the times of PIV combined with the Q-light signals. And then we identified such um, points given in white where we um, take a closer look at certain speed lines. Um, besides the lower um, rotational speeds, we um, investigated the nominal speed line at the 110% overspeed. And um, the three points that we are looking for, we named them clean, hump, and RE. So, Taking a look at the measurements at the first location in the inlet pipe, um, of course, we can calculate velocity field information and vector plots out of the data. And what you see here is um, the light sheet um, at the same location for different time instances of, um, at uh, 26 kilohertz frame rate you see the velocity structures that are coming into uh, the compressor from the inlet pipe. But this was not the focus of this research. So what we did is we took the center column of the slide sheet information, the pixel column, and extracted the single column data as time traces for our axial and transverse um, velocity component. And what we got is um, the time records of a single column. And those are about 1,000 samples, at least 30, uh, 38 milliseconds in length. And the height of the investigated area is, in this case, um, about 20 millimeter. <clears throat> and we did the same for the transverse velocity. So now we got um, the time history. And then we wanted to see what happened there and we removed the mean velocity from the flow to enhance the fluctuations in the flow. And this is what we ended up with. Um, the clean condition exhibits, this is the black line here in the center, exhibits RMS fluctuation of about 0.7 meter per second, corresponding of about 1% of the mean flow velocity. And when you're looking at the RE, which is the blue line, you see that it exhibits a very strong modulation in the fluctuation part with a peak-to-peak -peak, um, difference of about 15 meter per second if you take the whole sample. <clears throat> and um, 
about 10% actually of the mean. So what happened there? We assumed that we took some phenomena, that we really met some phenomena of instabilities occurring in the machine. But to learn more, we needed to take a closer look to the spectrum. And this is what we did. Um, in the upper row, you see the spectra calculated from the actual and transverse components of the velocity. The red curves is the actual velocity of the clean measurement, the hump measurement, and the RE measurement for a whole sample. And the blue line is um, the transverse velocity in the radial direction. And we put this side by side with a Q light um, spec power spectra at the inlet, 5% of the inlet, um, and compared to one Q light located downstream of the rotor. And then we compared those. And what you see is in the clean condition that we nicely see also some harmonics of the blade passing frequency. And we could detect the rotor frequencies, the blade passing frequencies, when we come to the beginning instabilities where those hump was coming up in the spectra of the Q-light, then you see that the hump is present in the upstream Q-light. When you're looking at the PID data, you see that there's something happening in the signal, but it's not so pronounced. That what we wanted to see is not present in that case. Then we took a closer look um, at the RE condition, where we assumed that rotating instabilities um, were also uh, already developed. We see that in the Q-light signal at the upstream location, um, that there is the ripple sign signature in the flow. But in the RE condition, in the um, PAV spectra, we try to find it, but it's not pronounced there. So what happened? I will come to this in a later point. We still have the second location downstream in the diffuser, right? Um, downstream of um, the impeller wheel. So uh, when we do not find the signature of rotating instabilities upstream of the wheel, then maybe we find it downstream in the PLV data. So we tried to do the same approach as in the upstream data. We took those single column time traces out of the center column of our light sheet. And what you see here is, as an example for the 60% speed line, um, time um, space history of the circumferential velocity component in the diffuser, so the tangential on a certain radius. So the center column of successive PIV samples put in history. There are several things that are very evident. The one is that for the clean, we remove the mean velocity to enhance the um, fluctuations in the flow again in this um, plots. So the clean plot is very homogeneous, while in the hump and RE, you nicely see um, the passing jet wake structures from the blades. So there's a difference in the flow from the clean to the hump. And you can see by this um, dashed line, um, the, um, the velocity de deficit after the blade arrival that prop propagates radially outwards. So this is what we find. But we also find at uh, certain distances, um, indicated by those white lines, um, samples that were strongly affected by laser flare because the um, blades are very close to the measurement location and the backscatter light from the um, impeller then disturbed our measurements in that case. We didn't expect that to that extent um, due to aliasing effects between the blade passing frequency and the image sampling rate, those blankings are not equidistant. So we did not manage 
to put an automated filter on that. We could detect the images, but we could not filter them out adequately to calculate spectra out of it. So this is why we could not calculate spectra very easily out of this bunch of data. Ah, okay, so far. What did we do? We um, asked our specialists from the Aeroacoustics Department to take a closer look at the Q-Light data to understand what happens in the machine. So we have those Q-Light arrays distributed all over the wheel and one upstream and directly downstream of the wheel. And what we asked them for is to take a look if the instabilities that we detected in the um, processed upstream Q-Light was also present in the downstream one and where those signatures may disappear. And what you can see here, we have um, the different speed lines, 40% RPM, 60% RPM, 100% and 110 speed lines, and then the different operating conditions in the different color plots. So you see the clean conditions in um, orange, a repro point, a reproduction point that is always measured together with um, at a lower speed line um, is also given here, but it's not so interesting, but you see that the clean points exhibit a very, very um, smooth spectra. And also you see um, some signatures of the blade passing frequencies. And for the hump and RE condition, which are given in red and green, you see that they are pronounced at the beginning, but that they disappear at the end. They, they get, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. But as you, see, you see that the, the phenomena is present, but we did not see it in the PAV data. So our conclusion was that we have confirmed the stability. And now this is what I would like to put as a resume for this project. We could confirm that the instabilities develop and the onset of instabilities is present in the same mechanism as previously reported in X-ray machines in a very, very, very um, precise and, and reproducible manner. But um, this signature footprints do not propagate far enough upstream or far enough downstream in the PAV data. Maybe we could have detected some residuals of this phenomenon in our downstream position, we could not put, um, produce the spectra data out of that. And upstream, we were too far upstream that this was not visible anymore. What about this resonance at the lower frequency, about 44 Hertz? Here we catched a pipe resonance, a system inherent structural resonance that turned out um, to be um, a geometrical issue and has nothing to do with any machine order or stuff like that, was very present in the PIV data. We fed this into the um, validation scheme of our um, accompanying CFD department and they catched it as well. So the resonance of the geometry was detected in the CFD data as well. So very good validation test case, but um, yeah, with the side effect that we could not use all the data for the purpose that it was collected for. But anyway, this extensive database is there for code validation. The PAV velocity information is there and um, we will use it for validation of the numerical methods um, further on. And of course, it is available for the technology um, research and development departments of our industrial partners. Yeah, lessons learned from this project, even in this comfortable situation where we, the DLR team, was involved very early in the design process and we could pr prepare every optical access to the needs of this specific machine component, but not possible to account for unforeseen behavior of flow phenomena and in this case, the laser flare at the end of the measurement. Um, So far, <laughs> that's research. 
I want to skip this project, uh, terminate this, and come to a very, very latest um, research that we are still busy with at our um, axial compressor um, at the Institute. We have a very old test case. This is um, first uh, established 20 years ago, but still um, part of research projects the counter-rotating shrouded prop fan. Um, this rig is operated at our um, two-shaft um, compressor facility at DLR Cologne, which is driven by two times five megawatt electrical motors. Um, for this um, counter-rotating rig, the front rotor stage has 10 blades and the downstream motor blade has 12 blades and they are designed for a speed ratio from 100 to 80% rotational speed. And the maximum rotor speed of the front rotor is um, 5,200 rotations per minute. This um, rig was in investigated in the DLR internal project um, Agatha. And the test objectives in this case were um, validation of aeromechanical optimization. A number of different measurement techniques were applied here from standard instrumentation like pressure and temperature probes, DMS, um, hot wire and fivefold probes, um, accomplished by optical measurements. And in this case, we did stereo PIV measurements on the incoming flow field for, in front of the um, first rotor. And what I would like to focus on today, the um, image pattern correlation technique where we wanted to measure the blade deformation under if, uh, aerodynamic load. <clears throat> the aim of the project is um, to investigate the blade behavior under boundary layer um, ingestion as expected for fuselage integrated fans. So there was upstream of the rotor, there was also a fence that was um, in, introduced in the incoming flow to, to include the disturbance of the inflow. Okay, um, the setup for our IPCT measurement techniques contains two parts. The one part is that we um, need light sources, of course, and um, we cannot use lasers in this case because lasers do produce speckle when you let it um, put on the surface that's moving and the surface themselves has um, a speckle plot dot pattern itself. So when you then introduce laser light on it, you would produce tremendous speckle um, patterns, but that would not support the kind of measurements that we would perform. So we needed another light source and here, um, as Chris Willard is um, very busy in investigating high power LEDs. Um, we try to use those um, with an in-house development for the driving and synchronization unit. So we were able to establish pulsed LED operation with one to two microseconds pulse lengths, very intense light. Um, and um, what we would like to do is to um, investigate the dynamic deformation, in particular the blades deflection and torsion and higher orders of flexure. Um, and that was, th those should be compared to numerical predictions. For the hub to tip monitoring shown here on the left hand side, we use two SCMOS cameras and um, uh, respective uh, light sources in form of LEDs. They were looking radially inside. The one camera was looking on markers on the blade tips and the other camera was looking on a marker on the hub. Um, and the other two cameras that we used were located um, on an external mount far upstream of the rotor. And then we have very large optical access with planar windows in the um, in this compartment, um, and those um, have a view on the blades. <coughs> and this looks like this. Here you see a, a fixed photo of um, the blades where you can see the, the random dot pattern um, that 
is used for the correlation-based processing of those stereoscopic image arrangement. And you see larger markers um, that we needed for the global positioning and mapping onto the CAD blade geometry during processing to find where the blade is and the initial curvature of the surface. We need to map that. <clears throat> and other cameras by looking at the tip and on markers on the hub, those were needed for um, the correction of the face um, of the rotor position in the window. Um, the stationary position of the fan blades was measured and this was a great challenge during um, setting up this experiment. Um, this was realized using a microcontroller operating at about 600 megahertz for continuous, continuous measurement of the um, position period provided by the one per revolution trigger of the shaft. So we got this information from a shaft trigger and then we fed this into our trigger unit and we saw on the screen the position of the blade on a certain instance and we needed to fix the position at the same up marker for each um, operating speed of the rotor. So this is why we needed this marker for to see that for each speed, we really match the correct face position of the rotor in the window. <coughs> and this is what we get from the tip markers then. Here you see um, the single shot markers of a measurement at 40% speed. And here you see um, the markers recorded at 15% speed. The 15% speed was used as a rever reference speed to calculate then the, the difference for all the other aerodynamic loads deformation. And here <coughs> within this recording, you can see um, a translation about 100 micrometer recorded within one microsecond of uh, illumination with this LED and um, camera trigger. <clears throat> the um, single shot measurement is quite sharp, but you can see um, a minor blurring of um, the dot pattern that is on the surface on the um, blades. This is due to the remaining three microseconds of jitter um, and rig vibrations. So this is not very sharp, but sharp enough for our later on evaluation. Okay, um, when you come to the operation and the data acquisition during um, the different operating conditions, then um, we always make a cross check during image acquisition with a reference image subtracted from the actual um, rotor position to see if we really are in the same position with the hub uh, markers. And here you can see nicely with this um, view, the aerodynamic load at 65% um, rotational speed. The black shadow here is the reference image and the white markers are the actual position. So we have just removed the, um, the reference image from the actual image in the snapshot uh, environment. <clears throat> so there are really millimeters of aerodynamic deformation during rig operation. It's very, very, very interesting to see that. And our colleagues are have been sitting today for the final measurements. So it's really a bunch of data to be pro processed and um, part of it will be um, subject to um, upcoming Lisbon conference paper. I hope uh, my colleague Joachim Klinger will be able to summarize all that. Unfortunately, I do not have any process data to show today, but this is really highlight application that we have because this IPCT um, was um, usually used by the group in Göttingen. Um, Markus Raffel and Andreas Schröder um, followed this approach years ago um, for helicopter rotor deformation analysis in a um, outer flow. Um, <clears throat> and for the first time now, we try to put this into the engine environment. 
So it's really challenging, um, but um, I think we had collected um, good quality data. So I'm really um, looking forward to, to the processed results. And to give you an um, insight to the aerodynamic load during 65% um, rotation and speed of the rotor. This is the um, handy image of our screen during rig operation, where you can nicely see um, the movement of the blade tip under aerodynamic operation. So the face of the rotor hub is fixed, really fixed by our trigger unit. So you really see the aerodynamic deformation in this case for this operating condition. Quite a highlight. I, I like this movie very much. <laughs> so impressive. Um, yeah, to summarize, um, what I've been talking about today is um, I try to give you an overview on our latest research activities, applying laser optical diagnostic tools in harsh turbo machinery environments. Um, <clears throat> we try to focus on combined and ideally simultaneous data acquisition to provide improved understanding of, of complex flow phenomena. Um, in this case, on the one hand, the onset of instabilities in a centrifugal compressor, and on the other hand, um, the surface deformation where we combine the stereoscopic viewing arrangement of a PIV set up with a new um, evaluation method to get this deformation out of it. And we still see the high potential of high-speed imaging methods, in this case, high-speed PIV and other derivatives of this measurement technique. And we still have to state there is no off the bat option for advanced laser optical methods, and this makes it time consuming, and especially in the post-processing of the data after the RIC measurements, um, we still need this human interface. The industry partners often ask for push the button and there's the report, but it's not feasible for that um, kind of environments that we would like to investigate. I would like to very much acknowledge um, all the work of my colleagues that have been made possible this talk today. It's not only my work, it's a bunch of people working on that subject. Um, and this is where I would like to say thank you for your attention with the impression of <laughs> giving the laser pointer again. Here, yeah. measurement campaigns before COVID, the control room is crowded and measurement campaigns during COVID conditions, where part of the crew was located outside near the stairs and the control room down there, the doors open, but only a few people around. This is the working conditions, but research is still possible. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Very happy to answer them. So uh, thank you, Melanie, for uh, this very detailed talk. Uh, as you said, I think it's uh, best to open for questions. So just uh, whoever wants, just feel free to to uh, open your camera and ask a question, or who is in the room, uh, just feel free to ask the question directly. Francesco, could you please be so kind to um, form as moderator for the incoming questions to the chat because in my yes. actual screen I cannot see the chat. Yes, I, if someone writes in the chat, I will report the question. Right, thank you. So is there a question from the audience in the room? Maybe we can start with that. Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions actually, but let me start with the first one. Concerning the, the last part of the presentation, I had a question, but I, I had also did the answer at the end, but never. Uh, well, what you are getting is the image of a blade uh, uh, for each revolution. You are always uh, looking at the same blade? Yes. Okay. It's exactly the same blade. We have only one blade covered with those uh, retro reflective paint. And um, it's triggered with the shaft trigger and then the correct phase in our um, synchronization unit. And then uh, we always look at the same blade. But the um, image acquisition is um, 
about, I don't know, only 20 hertz or 25 hertz. It wasn't that, it was no high speed application. Yes, so you have the one image every, I don't know how many revolution. Every suitable revolution when we found the trigger unit to manage that the plate that we want to see is fixed in our face reference slot. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then the, the deformation you can see is due to the, the uh, there, there is a static part and the dynamic part. Yes. Uh, and uh, how are you sure that your uh, or not <laughs> of, the, the, of your frequency uh, acquisition frequencies decoupled from one given uh, uh, frequency of vibration of the blade? And that the uh, the number of images makes it possible because we acquire um, like in a PIV a standard PIV sample um, up to thousand images, and they are independent from each other because um, you have those stationary like stereo viewing arrangement with the yes. two cameras that look onto the surface of the blade, and you have those two with the marker for the precise position positioning. And with the trigger unit, um, we do double check. On the one hand, it's the, the time synchronization that the trigger unit provides. And on the other hand, we have this marker on the um, hub of the um, rotor that we can check for every change in operating conditions that we still have the same hub position of our marker. This is checked through every change of operation conditions that this position is always with this removement of the reference image in uh, no motion that this is perfectly matching. So the shaft position then is the same yes. from the reference image without operation, from the reference image at 15% speed. And then for every other speed line, we put this hub markers on top again. And this is only some half of microseconds to, to be changed to make it matching again. Yeah, okay. And then what the rest that's happening is aerodynamic load on the blade plus those about three microseconds inherent jitter of our calculation routine. But this is um, when you see the amplitudes there, yeah. the jitter is marginal. You, um, I can go back to this slide with the... Uh, Here, yeah, the motion blur of the average image is, is not so much that you would think that um, the change in position of the rotor at a certain fixed um, operating condition is, is too large. So the size between the, the amplitude is much higher between the different aerodynamic loads. So the blur in this case is the jitter of the average image on a fixed um, yeah. operating condition. And this difference, the other people did not see, I need to make the laser pointer here. This difference is due to aerodynamic load, but the blurring in this, around this average part of the superimposed images is due to the jitter. So we are quite sure that we get rid of this, what you say, um, yeah. like positioning uh, inaccuracy or something. Okay. Does it answer this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's quite impressive. I was uh, thinking this over part. So, yeah. Thank you. So, so far we don't have questions in the chat. So is there someone else who would like to ask a question in the room? <coughs> It's, it's not I can ask my second question. <laughs> uh, can you go back to the, I think it was slide 24, but I'm not sure that this was the slide with the PIV results on the second position in the, so here you are yeah. in the diffuser, right? Yes. The, and the, uh, uh, sorry, I missed, what is the, the Y axis? The y-axis is just the width of the light sheet. Yes, but in... In, in radial direction. So um, I need to go back to um, another image. 
then it becomes, I hope it becomes more clear. The setup is given. Yes, you, here. you are showing it. Here. Yeah. Okay. When we, the light sheet is introduced from the outer in a radial direction. And then this direction is the dimension height that you've seen on slide 24. Yeah. Okay. So you see the tangential part of the velocity in this case. Yes. Okay. Okay, and then I was surprised because you have said that uh, for the uh, normal operating condition, I don't know if it's nominal or I don't remember, but you are not able to, to see clearly the wake of the... Apparently not, no. It was very homogeneous and um, I can go back to this slide. When we remove the mean velocity value from the flow to enhance structures, then we end up with, yeah, that picture for this um, operating condition, 60% um, rotational speed, and we have experienced the same result for, for the other speed lines. Um, I haven't shown them here, but in other um, um, reports, they are included. Um, that for the clean part, um, the structures are not as pronounced. But for um, the operating conditions with higher back pressure, you see a very strong and clear developing jet wake structure in the history. Yeah, I have no yes, so explanation for that. Why? Yeah, but it yes. is, of course, apparently there's. Um, um, a more distinct um, jet wake structure. Yeah, maybe because the problem the flow is detached at uh, or partially part yeah. detached at the yeah. in, uh, in the main channel. So you have a, a secure uh, wake, and you may see it more clearly in the. Yeah, chair. yeah. We suppose that um, the tip clearance vortex then is larger, and this forms. A blockage area in the in, in the passage of the blade, and then the remaining area is smaller, and then this increases the velocity of the passing flow. Yeah. So you have a stronger jet then. And when you have nominal conditions like this, should be the clean conditions, then there might be a very very fast and smooth um, mixing of the wake and jet and remaining tip clearance structures, but this is very, very, very scratched on the surface of this data. Yeah. Maybe in the future when we have a bit more time, we, we can take a look again at this bunch of data to, um, to see if we can squeeze anything out of it. It was such a pity. We have terabytes of data and we have this picture. So maybe we find a solution or if anybody has an idea how to overcome this um, disaster with the laser flare and the uh, missing fit routines to yeah. get rid of that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. One one question regarding this specific point. Actually, I wanted to ask, but I took the chance from uh, to 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 get uh, connected to the question of Antoine. Uh, 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 so, um, in uh, do you uh, actually see the development of any instability in the at nominal condition? Because, for example, that's uh, this is something which yeah. we see in our centrifugal pump. And uh, that's quite much related to to the to the um, uh, number of blades uh, of the impeller that's kind of triggering an, a secondary instability. And uh, in this sense, the instability you see at nominal condition, does it uh, somehow feeds back on the impeller? Uh, eventually uh, producing a mode zero that uh, generates a separation or uh, I don't know. Yeah, um, then I have to go a bit more deep into the, the entire project context. Um, what we see from this data is on the one hand that the instability amplitudes are higher for the lower speed lines. 
Yeah, when you take a look at those, then here the the pronunciation of the peaks is more flat, and at the lower speed lines you have larger amplitudes in the in the spectral peaks um, for the rotating instability feature. And um, as far as I remember, just from the analysis of the Q light data, of course, there have been Q lights in the diffuser section and the volute as well. I didn't touch this here. Um, the, um, the phenomena got mixed out downstream. So we could not verify or um, identify the signature of RE downstream in the diffuser. And this is why I get a bit lost with the spectral data um, during my talk, because the, um, the plots look quite the same, but um, they then show the sequence of Q lights through the machine and not through the different operating conditions. Um, if this answers your question, downstream in the diffuser, we could not anymore detect this um, signature of the rotating instabilities. It's mixed out. But um, one driving mechanism um, of periodic effects um, visible in the spectra, or even for this resonance far upstream, might be that in the volute, there seems to be a separation bubble. This has been detected um, or identified in the numerical results. There's a recirculation zone in, in, in the largest um, cross-section area of, of the volute. And this um, is heavily oscillating. Um, and this oscillation is um, driven, of course, obviously driven by the throttling, of, by increasing the back pressure. So the resonance then gets more pronounced at higher speeds and at um, increasing back pressure operating conditions. So there is a coupling from volute effects to upstream rotor flow aerodynamics. And what was done in the project in the numerical part is they changed the volume geometry. They had a different distribution of the cross section, sections over this volume um, developing flow past. And apparently it would be possible to remove the effect of this periodic um, triggering by um, changing the cross section development of the volute and then this um, separation bubble could be reduced or was reduced in the numerical results. And this was a very insightful result of this project for the industrial partner. So maybe they can use this for redesign the stage. We hoped to acquire a follow-up project where we would do the, this optimization for the partner, but uh, obviously COVID played a role and lack of money maybe because this um, call was never placed um, after this project. But this would be really interesting to see maybe a new volute um, body on the rig, how this behaves then. Numerically, we could achieve an improvement. And then we would like to see it on the machine again, maybe with a new um, yeah, set of Q lights distributed, because what we learned also is that the Q lights should be very close to the place where we are measuring with PAV. The far upstream position was useful for inlet domain characterization for numerical um, investigation, but it was completely useless for the search event characterization. And the downstream part, we might have learned a lot from that. Yeah. From the data in the Q lights data set, uh, there's still. Um, tiny signature of the instabilities. Maybe if we would have been lucky, we could have identified it in the PRV data as well, but in this case, yeah, it didn't work the way we planned. So, uh, so um, it, it can, uh, if, if I, if I try to, to, is, is it correct to, 
to say that uh, basically the instability you observe is actually a system instability rather than uh, purely like uh, uh, simple uh, simple or can, kind of uh, um, academic uh, uh, fluid mechanic instability that could be somehow explained by by a, a sort of linearized approach it's really like the combination between uh, it's it's a system you, you observe a system instability that combines the volute and the the impeller and out of this uh, 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 out of this coupling, you kind of get uh, the resulting jet, and the diffuser basically works as a mixer, as a as a, as a mixing element. It's both. The what we have marked here as rotating instabilities, and this hump is really aerodynamic reaction of uh, the rotor itself. This is aerodynamic. Yeah. The periodical stuff um, and the resonance part, this is system inherent and not uh, linked to, to any rotor stuff. Because um, a, a criterion for RE signatures, like those ripples here, is that they are not rotor phase lock, but they are off harmonics. And um, those lines where it's hard to see, but in, in the papers, maybe it's more enhanced. Um, here are red lines on top of the, of the frequency um, markers, and those are placed on the max amplitude of the ripples, and those are off um, the um, shaft uh, frequency. So that's a point. 102.204.83 um, with respect to, to the rotor frequency. So the aerodynamic part is really there. It's due to the aerodynamic behavior and um, 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 stall cell development in the rotor itself. And another fact, and that might be strongly linked to, to the volume, to the separation bubble and any other Resonance effects of the facility itself, those are um, related to this resonance and periodic parts. This would be our conclusion. We have both effects and they are separated from each other. Okay. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, uh, so once again, for the moment, I don't see questions in the chat, so if is there someone else who would like to... Yeah, so please. Uh, it was about the high power LED, actually. Can, can you... I don't know, actually, how it works. Can, can you say a few words about the, when it can replace a laser and what are the, the parameters of this kind of light? Mm -hmm. Frequency, intensity, and when is it adapted for the... for the fluid? Um, the, the, the LEDs that we have at hand, this is a special tool that's uh, in the development of Chris Willard. So um, he plays around with LEDs for some years right now with different um, types and different um, um, electronic parts and stuff like that. And he always has his own driving unit um, being together in his lab, in his electronic corner of the lab. So it's nothing off the shelf, it's all in-house development besides the LED itself. Um, what I can say is that LEDs are useful if you do not need collimated light. Even if you put place lenses on it, you cannot really collimate it. So if you need a collimated beam, you need a laser. In this case, we, need, we, we um, have used the LEDs because we would um, avoid to speckle stuff and um, thanks to the initiative of, of Chris Willard, um, he has driven this LEDs to, to such a um, high um, pulse energy operation. I'm not so deeply in that subject, I have to admit, but um, let me see if I have noted down some details in my note. 
But if you are interested in that, maybe I can provide you with um, the part of the paper that is um, to appear in Lisbon um, as supplementary material to, to the slides, maybe with, when I get the clearance to, to put them online, then um, I can ask for the supplementary material um, related to the LEDs. Sure. Because okay. it's, it's published, it's published in, in um, other papers before from uh, Chris Willett, so if you look it up, it's easy to find. And the group of um, the Göttingen colleagues of DLR around um, Andreas Schröder and Daniel Schanz um, <coughs> um, and their uh, Staziki. Staziki was the first guy to, to operate those LEDs. So in this context, of it, you, you can find it, but of course I will... Um, Make sure to, to put some supplementary material to this study. Francesco, I will provide you with that and then you can distribute it with the other material. That's great. That's good. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so. I don't see any question in the chat, so I think from this side we are good. Uh, are there any more questions in the room? I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. okay, cool, cool. So then I think we can uh, uh, we can uh, close the, the seminar. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having accepted the, the invitation and I invite the uh, audience to to thank uh, to thank the the speaker of today. Thanks a lot, Melanie. Okay. Cool. So for whoever is uh, uh, attending uh, online, so I so I hope to to see you all next week for uh, the last webinar of uh, of the semester, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>